not to start because I've already I've already been playing, but uh, to add to. Then we'll read a little bit of prose and some poetry too. That I shouldn't still love you I'll tell you that Well, if I didn't say it I'd still have felt it Where's the sense in that? Promise I'm not trying To make your life harder Or return to where we were I will go down with the ship I won't put my hands up and surrender There will be no white flag above my door I'm in love And always will be I know I left too much pain and destruction To go back again Caused you nothing but trouble I understand if you won't talk to me again And if we live by the rules that it's over Well, I'm sure that that makes sense I will go down with the ship I won't put my hands up and surrender There will be no white flag above my door I'm in love And always will be And when we meet I'm sure we will I'll play alone Hold my tongue And not pretend That I'm old oh, oh, oh. I will go down with this ship White flag above my head. I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love. And always will. It's a really serious song, isn't it? Um, this is more silly. It's a, this is a song by Mose Allison, who's this wonderful um, kind of cool jazz, uh, old white cool jazz player who wrote these great songs. Um, and uh, many years ago, I met the Doobie Brothers. This is just like not to like talk about weird, you know, um, brushes with fame. But I actually met the Doobie Brothers, and they they were the first people who ever uh, turned me on to this this guy, Mose Allison, and this is called I Don't Worry About a Thing. Oops, not that one. If this world is driving you to drink, you're sitting around wondering what's a thing Well, I got some consolation, I'll give it to you with my might I don't worry about a thing, cause I know nothing's going to be alright Well, 
this world is one big trouble spot Some have plenty and some have not Well, I used to be in trouble, but I finally saw the light I don't worry about a thing, cause I know nothing's going to be alright Don't waste your time trying to be a go-getter. Things will get worse before they're gonna get better. You know there's always somebody who's playing with dynamite. I don't worry about a thing, cause I know nothing's going to be all right. If this world is driving you to drink, you're sitting around wondering what to think. Well, I got some consolation, I'll give it to you if I might. to be Whoa. Might as well laugh, you know, the world's going in, down into the crappers. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing left to do but laugh about it, I guess. It's just so great to see everybody. Um, like the rest of you, I imagine, I spent a lot of time in the last couple of years, year and a half, in uh, solitude and uh, playing a lot of music at, in, at home in my house to my dogs who think I'm awesome. <laughs> um, but I do bribe them with treats, you know, after I finish a song. But um, I'm just so thrilled to be here and I'm I'm really glad that this sounds like this is your first live in person event for some time and I just have had a lot of time to think over the last couple of years since we've been through this sort of horrifying catastrophic time about the value of being in the presence of other people and especially for writers uh, to be able to read to each other I understand you all have a really active open mic and poetry slam and you know it's just like that's where you learn that's where you learn how to get better that's where you learn to see how people are affected by your work and how you make connections that really, you know, end up being lifelong connections. Some of the friendships you're probably making right now, you're going to take probably, you know, into your um, professional lives and into your, you know, adulthood and later adulthood. Um, so I'm really just grateful to be here and get to read to you. I thought, you know, I have a new book. Um, the Night We Landed on the Moon, that I actually think I'm going to read from, um, I read from that yesterday, so maybe I'm going to read from this one instead. This is my memoir um, about growing, the horizontal world, growing up wild in the middle of nowhere. And um, I'm just going to read you kind of like some of the opening section of this. Um, I grew up in a small town in North Dakota, and my parents were farmers, and my grandparents, my grandfathers and my great-grandparents had come from Russia. They were part of an ethnic group called Germans from Russia. I think there are probably Germans from Russia around here in, um, in Nebraska, and uh, it's a weird kind of ethnic group, but um, I really, you know, grew up in this very sort of isolated um rural place and there was no art or anything around me but I was like this sort of dreamy imaginative kid and I loved music and I loved you know music from church and um and from choir and I think it was music that kind of kept me going so this is a little portrait of those early years the farmhouse I grew up in was once an ice house a thick hull of four walls where ice was stored for people to buy in slab form before home refrigeration. People say my great-grandfather, Joseph Marquardt, bought the ice house from the Creamery in town a few years after he emigrated to Dakota Territory from his village in South Russia. They say he hauled it with oxen across the lake that stands between our farm and town, 
during the coldest part of winter when the lake was completely frozen over. He dragged the shell of the ice house up the hill of our farm, and he set it on the basement foundation that he had prepared. He added a second floor with many rooms for all his children and a balcony that ran around the exterior of the second floor. My older cousin, Tony, who grew up in the house, told me that great grandpa liked to sit on the balcony and look out over the many acres he owned. He liked to imagine the generations of his family that would live there together in this place for many years to come. It was a big, drafty farmhouse with creaky wood floors, one bathroom installed in the 50s, a large kitchen with a round table in the center, a coal furnace in the basement, and staircases steep as ladders. The bedrooms were hot and airless in the summer, freezing in the winter. The windows blew like saxophones in the hard wind of Alberta clippers. Each day of the winter, I woke up cold in that ice house, my red nose peeking out from under the blankets. I dreaded setting my bare foot down on the freezing wood floor. I knew some of my grandparents had died in those rooms. As a child, I remember my mother as overworked and preoccupied slamming doors and cupboards. She was always busy with her hands, milking cows, washing dishes, canning, sewing, gardening, working with the farm bills, the messy pile of receipts, her worried fingers on the calculator. She was always running from place to place. In the barn, she would throw a milker on the cow and then run across the yard into the house to put dinner in the oven. From my upstairs teenage bedroom, where I was reading or listening to the radio or playing my big K guitar with two squiggly Fs for sound holes, I might be singing spirituals or protest folk songs about suffering and endless hours of labor in the fields, and I would hear her open, fling the, or the, fling the door open downstairs, and then the house would shake with the stomping of her feet. She'd throw open the refrigerator and tear the roast from its wrapper. She'd clatter a pan on the kitchen counter and then throw the roast in with a loud thump. She'd tear open the packet of French onion soup, sprinkle it over the meat, run a little tap water into the pan, throw the whole thing in the oven and out the door, be out the door and back to the barn in time to take the milker off the finished cow and put it on the next one. One day my mother stopped at the foot of the stairs to listen to me. I didn't hear her come in. I was practicing my solo for choir. I was testing the limits of my voice. The Lord's Prayer, I remember I was singing. For thine is the kingdom. I was climbing to the crescendo and the power. I was building to the climax and the glory, approaching the rarefied atmosphere only the first soprano can inhabit forever. I was holding and holding the second syllable, the high note, forever. I was stretching time, losing meter, my voice shaking the windows with its power. And before I could bring it down to the amen, settle the song gently to the ground, I heard another voice break through, a louder voice screaming from downstairs, I could barely make it out. The words, shut up, I heard. <laughs> and my mother's voice screaming louder than I could sing. Shut up, and yelling up the stairs. Don't sing in the house. My mother's voice yelling, just stop singing in the house. What is the sound of a pilgrim soul singing? As a child growing up in North Dakota, I felt myself wanting to grow tall and wild. When you're young, it's natural to be green and vivid, but I heard cautions all around me. You're not so hot. Don't get too big for your britches. How to find sustenance and nurture oneself to maturity in a place that yields only 16 inches of precipitation a year. Like the grasses and crops around us, we lived on the narrow margin of life. Large houses, shiny cars, nice clothes, big talk, all unnecessary expenditures of limited resources. Best not to sprout unsustainable foliage. Then what will you do during the dry years? We watched each other for signs of vanity. Anyone inclined toward extravagance was pruned back 
wing clipped. She's beautiful, but she knows it. He thinks his shit doesn't stink. <laughs> if I were a flower, I thought, I would want to be a hollyhock, a tall, sturdy stalk opening large flowers everywhere, or a tiger lily, orange and black petals opening shamelessly to the world. I knew the effects of drought. I had witnessed it in my father's fields, stalks and sheaves withered on the vine, nothing sadder than the nodding dry head of a bud. Still, I dared to imagine myself in full blossom. I could be the pampered rose, unbridled beauty accompanied by thorns, or the hothouse orchid, a fragile thing that everyone fusses over. Even in this dry place, I told myself, I must find a way to bloom. I must never allow myself to be blighted. In 1974, my parents drove me to Bismarck, where I would be attending junior college, and they dropped me off at the front door of my girls' dorm with my few boxes of clothes, records, and books. They didn't come up to my room. They were worried about rush hour traffic and getting home in time to do the chores. The goodbyes were not tearful. I was the youngest and wildest of their five children. I won't say they were glad to be rid of me, Perhaps they were just happy to be on their own for the first time in 25 years. I suppose I stood on the front steps of the dorm and I waved goodbye to them as they drove off. And I imagine they waved back. They were not the kind of people who didn't wave back. The half mile stretch of gravel road leading out of my parents' farm is framed on either side by cottonwood trees that are over 70 feet tall. My great-grandfather planted these trees grown from a packet of government seeds given to prairie farmers after he arrived from Russia in the 1880s. In my 1960s childhood, I felt the cottonwoods loomed like giants over us, ringing the northern edge of our yard. I was frightened of their height. I had nightmares that the thick trunks would come down in the heavy wind, that they would fall the entire length of our big backyard break through the roof, and crush me in my bed. I did not understand then about the deep tangle of roots underneath that holds everything up, that holds things in place. The day before I left home for college, I took a photograph of the road leading out of my parents' farm, the long driveway stretching out to the open wheat fields and the giant tops of the cottonwoods reaching up to the sky. The photograph must have been taken in late afternoon the shadows are long. The light is cast in gold and bronze, the sweet color of memory. The picture of home was one undeveloped frame in my camera, the first in a succession of images that I plan to collect of more interesting places. I got myself on that road and I did not wave back. I concentrated only on flight. And for a long time, it seemed to me, North Dakota looked best only when glanced at briefly while adjusting the rear view mirror. Thank you. And that's part of the prologue of, of this memoir that was published really about this pull of home and the way that even if you, you know, there's a great quote from Scott Russell Sanders about the pull of home ground. And he says, um, you know, it's the landscape that you knew before you retreated into the illusion of your own skin. And he says, you may hate the place if you've, if you've floundered there and love the place if you flourish there, but love it or hate it, you cannot break through, through no matter where you go. Even if you move to the antipodes, you cannot break free of your home ground. And that's like certainly been a tension that's in my work. Uh, I just keep returning to write about North Dakota, you know, just is this kind of endlessly fascinating place to me. So I just tell you that because I know there are some writers in this in this room. And um, I mean, I've traveled a lot. I've written a lot about traveling in Greece and, and in, in Russia. And I went to the villages my ancestors came from. So I'm, I've written a lot about other parts of the world. But I just kind of keep like home is this touchstone. I always go back to it. So... Um, I'm going to read a few poems. Is that okay? Are we doing okay for time? Okay. Um, th these poems are from my 
most recent poetry collection, Smallberry Thing. And I want to read this opening poem in this that um, it, it, it's actually um, a poem inspired by a trip I took to the State Historical Museum in Iowa, in Des Moines, Iowa. And there was a medical display. So, you know, they've got this historical museum. They've got all kinds of weird stuff. And they've got a lot of it in storage. And they bring it out every once in a while and put it on exhibit. And this was, I talk about it in the poem, but I will, I'll explain briefly. It was a display of an ear, nose, and throat doctor who practiced in Des Moines for something like three decades. And it was a, it was, it had like, um, it was really nicely put together um, exhibit and it had his, um, his medical instruments on display. And then it had, but it, the weird part of it was there were these shadow boxes that he had built. They were wood cases with glass fronts and in them he had, um, installed everything he had extracted from people's throats and noses and ears over the decades. <laughs> and it was just like, I was just like stunned. You know, I just knew it was a poem as soon as I saw it. Um, and this turned out to be kind of a list poem and cause I just pulled out my little notebook and I just started listing everything that was in the display cases. So this is called um, things not to put in your mouth. <laughs> Medical Display, Iowa State Historical Museum, Des Moines, Iowa. A penny, a quarter, a button, a paper clip. Safety pins closed and open, most ingested while changing diapers. In two shadow boxes, Dr. James Downing displayed the objects he'd extracted from patients' food and air passages between 1929 and 1956. A wishbone, a kernel of corn, over large, a pen nib, beads from a necklace with a string still attached, a nail, a screw, a cover from a bottle of anison, thumb tacked in rows, suspended in glass scene envelopes. The objects floated in the glass cases, a warning about things not to put in your mouth. A toothpick, a rhinestone earring, a wadded up ball of paper, a metal snap, a cockleburr seed spiky as a porcupine, a long sewing needle, a, sad, a sardine can turnkey, many small chicken bones, things with sharp edges, cumbersome things that get caught in the throat, things that go down hard and refuse to come up, a Daughters of the American Revolution pendant, a gold hinge from a jewelry box, a price tag marked 89 cents for item number 1025293 from the Yonkers department store. <laughs> the exhibit includes the doctor's leather medical bag and his instruments of extraction, a tracheal dilator, a uvula dilator, laryngeal and esophageal forceps, along with a humorous note jotted in a hospital report. Feed her anything but nickels and pennies the note reads, beside the very nickel extracted from the child's throat. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. So that, that poem, you know, when I wrote it, when I wrote that poem, um, the poem kind of began to grow and you might find this when you, with your own things that you're writing, you know, you can write lots of pieces, poems or stories or essays. But then sometimes you write something, it just feels like this kind of like, and Hill that a lot of other poems or pieces of writing are going to climb out of. And that's the way this poem was for me. Um, I began to, to realize that um, this is my third collection of poetry. And I wrote, you know, the first two collections I wrote about some of the easier stories, some of the family stories. And then after you publish, you know, three, four, five books, you have to really start going for the, the fruit that's a little higher up, the stuff that's not as easy to get to. And I, I'm mixing my metaphors here, but um, I started to see these poems as kind of like these tracheal, you know, uvula dilators that they were reaching in and they were pulling things out, you know, that I had on my, in, my, in my notebooks or I had an idea to write about, but I just hadn't found a way. So um, this is one of those poems. I want to read it and... Um, it's, it's about um, a family story that we had um, for many, many years about the, um, the day when my sister Judy blew out the ceiling of my brother's bedroom with a shotgun accidentally. Um, and so, you know, as you can imagine, um, fortunately, no one was hurt. I was actually right there 
kept very close to her when it happened. And um, so it became kind of a funny family story. And I, it was in my notebook for many years, just shotgun, a reminder, like, you're going to write about that someday. But it just took me decades. So here it is. Kablooey is the sound you'll hear. Kablooey is the sound you'll hear. Then plaster falling and the billow of gypsum. After your sister blows a hole in the ceiling of your brother's bedroom with the shotgun he left loaded and resting on his dresser. It's Saturday. The men are in the fields. You and your sister are cleaning house with your mother. Maybe your sister hates cleaning that much. Or maybe she's just that thorough. But somehow she has lifted the gun to dust it or dust under it. You are busy mopping the stairs. And from the top landing where you stand, you turn toward the sound to see your sister cradling the smoking shotgun in her surprised arms, like a beauty queen clutching a bouquet of long-stemmed roses after being pronounced the official winner. <laughs> then the smell of burnt gunpowder reaches you, dirty orange and sulfurous, like spent fireworks. And through the veil of smoke, you see a hole smoldering above her head. A halo of perforations in the ceiling, the drywall blown clean through insulation to the naked joists, that dark constellation where the buckshot spread. The look on your sister's face is pure shit-faced shock. You'd like to stop and photograph it for blackmail or future family stories, but now you must focus on the face of your mother frozen there at the base of the stairs where she has rushed from vacuuming or waxing, her frantic eyes searching your face for some clue about the extent of the catastrophe. It's like that heavy quicksand dream where you can't move or speak. So your mother scrambles up the steps on all fours, rushes past you to the room where your sister has just now found her voice, already screaming her story. It just went off. It just went off, as if a shotgun left to rest on safety would rise and fire itself. All this will be hashed and rehashed around the supper table. But what stays with you all these years later, what you cannot forget, is that moment when your mother waited at the bottom of the steps for a word from you. One word. And all you could offer her was silence. Mm. Um, so, uh, just a little note about writing that, you know, the story was there because it had been refined around the supper table, as I say in the poem, but it was only when I had that, um, just that moment, I thought about my mother and what she must have gone through in that microsecond when, you know, it's like the billow of gypsum and I'm standing there at the top of the stairs, but, you know, I can see my sister, but she can't. And she's just looking at me like imploring, like, what, you know? And it was when I finally connected emotionally with that moment that I was able to really write the poem. So I say this to, you know, say to those of you who are writing pieces, sometimes you just have to, you can't force it. You just have to put down what you can and then let, you know, just wait for the rest of it to flow to you. And then maybe the, like, the, the best thing to do is prepare yourself, you know, get your antenna out and your receptivity out so that you're, you can hear it or you can see it when it kind of floats to you and you're like, oh, that's the, that's the missing piece, you know. Um, let's see, this is fun. I haven't read these poems for so long. Um, okay. Traveling with guitar. So, you know, I travel quite a bit and I, this is, I have a, little, a smaller Taylor guitar. It's a, it's a Taylor travel guitar and you can actually stash it um, in the overhead compartment so when I travel, I'll, you know, fly, I'll take that one. And it's just like I, I tracked all these people in the airport when I walked through the airport with a guitar. So this is about this, traveling with guitar. For you can travel with a screaming red rolling bag and float unnoticed on conveyors through terminals, or you can lug half of a moose rack from Maine to Minnesota, carry it like a broken wing through airports, as my friend Gro did, and draw only the curious touches of children waiting at gates. But dare to travel with a guitar and invite confessions from strangers in pinstripe suits about their garage band summers, 
invite winks, invite gotcha smiles and devil's horn, rock on gestures, invite finger points and more winks and long tongue licks and the rubber neck glance to check if you are someone famous. To dare to travel with a guitar is to mark yourself charismatic megafauna of the airport terminal. Old friend, what else could I do but carry you? I have stored you in closets, propped you in corners, hunched over you late nights, staring perplexed at the mysteries of your neck, body of my body, string of my strings. See how the world began to hum and sing that day at 13 when I opened the big birthday box. So that was so. My mom and dad gave me this uh, K guitar, the aforementioned K guitar with two squiggly Fs for sound holes. And it was a boat. I mean, it was just like, it was the biggest guitar I've ever seen in my life. It somehow got absorbed into the guitar, guitar collections of one of my guitar player boyfriends, somewhere along the line, so I lost it. But um, it, it, um, it was not easy to play, but oh my God, when I got that, I was just like, guitar, you know, it's exciting. I'm going to just read a few more poems. These are um, these are newer poems, and uh, they're in my new collection coming out next year, Gratitude with Dogs Under Stars, and um, well, we just passed this season. Do you all get, you have choke cherries over here in Nebraska, don't you? We they, In Iowa, we don't have them, so I just feel like, oh. I tried to grow some choke cherry trees, but they didn't, they didn't take. Anyway. We always would go out and pick choke cherries in August and make jams, and they taste like nothing else. But when I began to research choke cherry, because I always research things before I write, um, I discovered that they're highly toxic and poisonous. The the leaves, the branches, the roots, everything, um, the seeds, the the pit that's inside, they're all kind of poisonous. And the only thing that isn't is this, you know the, the uh, actual fruit. Choke cherry, prunus melon carpa. Go in August with sisters, down the fly buzz dusty rows of the elms, ashes, poplars that great grand grandfather planted to slow the wind. Go swinging ice cream buckets braceleted on wrists. All summer this ripening, the sweaty cicada hum, and choke cherries, deadly green droops turned black cherry, then burnt umber. Now the skin, tough and tart, leaves a sandy pucker on the tongue, a catch of grit in the throat. Our maroon fingers thread branches as we heavy the harvest into buckets. The poison carried home to cure, cull, then siphon in colanders, to steam kitchen, then thicken to jams, syrups, Pint jars stored in root cellar rows, the purple stain of summer shored up against winter's long, white bleak. Remember how sometimes you'd swallow a pit? Sweet cyanide of childhood, preserved in bones. So, okay. Yeah, we would sometimes swallow them, and as far as I know, um, they don't come out the other end. Someone else can tell me if, they, if they've ever witnessed that, but I don't think they do. So, I'll just read one more poem and then maybe do a last song. Um, so this is a poem um, that uh, I actually wrote it right around the time that the, um, the Affordable Care Act debate was going on. And this was in 2012, and my sister, the, the one who blew out the ceiling of my brother's bedroom with shotgun. She died unexpectedly. Um, and she was only 58, which increasingly I think is like way too young. So, um, and so, I, you know, I, I realized in retrospect after her death that um, she didn't have health insurance. And um, I've been lucky. I've, all, I've been, since I came off the road, I've had jobs where I've had, you know, a salary and health insurance. And uh, she worked her whole life, raised five kids, you know, worked two jobs, and she didn't have the kinds of the security that so many of us just enjoy. This is called Pre-Existing Conditions, and um, and it has an epigraph from Sister Simone Campbell, and she, she gave an address to the uh, Democratic National Convention in 2012, 
And this is when this debate was going on about health care. And she said, I am my sister's keeper. Three weeks ago, my sister went on a lunch break and turned right for home rather than left for the clinic, where she might have been forced to admit to the doctor that the pain in her left arm was something more than the chronic ache in her left shoulder from the ladder fall while cleaning last year. Instead, she went home for soup, which is where my brother found her the next morning, seated at the kitchen counter with her head resting in her arms as if she'd only fallen asleep after her boss reported that she hadn't come to work. She rose each day at 5 a.m. to bake muffins and fresh bread to make the potato salad and rotisserie chickens that stock the coolers and shelves for the convenience of people who don't have time to cook. Too young for Medicare at 58, she earned an hourly wage that held her just above the poverty line, just enough to disqualify her for Medicaid. I see now how she fell between the cracks. Sure, she tempted fate, cooked with too many eggs, too much salt, sugar, butter, and cream. Food was the love she offered to the world. And didn't we gobble up every rich thing she put before us? Did she calculate the cost of the coverage offered her under the new Health Care Act and think, $400 a month, that's a car payment. That's 40 hours of labor. That's a full week of wages. How I wish she'd been forced to buy it. On that last morning, did she turn right for home instead of left for the clinic because she knew a trip to the doctor would mean a quadruple bypass, loss of a job, bankruptcy, and the forced foreclosure of a house almost paid for, $700 left on the mortgage at the time of her death. So did she decide to take the pain and risk it, believing she was too tough to die? Well, she wasn't. To be human is to walk around with pre-existing conditions, always some muscle or valve poised to fail, some cell ready to grow wild. Never before have I wanted to speak to my president and say, hurry up with this. She was my sister. Do you understand? As children, we shared a bathtub in those years of once a week Saturday night washings. I can still feel her soapy back against mine. As teenagers, we shared a bedroom, whispering late into the darkness between our twin beds, until one of us would grow tired and say, Little Red Schoolhouse on the Hill, which was our private code for, shut up now so that I can get some sleep. <laughs> so that's pre-existing. Thank you so much. Maybe just end with one song. I really appreciate your patience, and um, I feel like I've lulled you all in this sort of sleepy stay here. Hopefully, no one will scream, stop singing in the house. It's happened to me before. This is a song of my own that I wrote called Just a Thing, and um, <coughs> should I tell you anything about it? Well, we haven't recorded this yet. We're trying to get into the studio to record um, a whole bunch of new songs that we've written, my band, The Bone People, but it's hard. My guitar player lives in Iowa City now, and I live in Ames, and my conga player is like in three or four bands. I don't know. Do people just have to be in four bands now? <laughs> You know, so just booking him is just hard. And then the pandemic. And so um, anyway, here it is. Just a thing. Saw you at the post office. Brought her love letters in the mailroom slot Saw you down on Main Street Riding by to your girlfriend's house Seems you're everywhere in town 
except the place you're supposed to be. Seems you're always running around, except you ain't running into me. All my friends, they tell me it's a thing. Is this a thing? Just a thing I have for you. What my friends can't seem to do is tell me what I'm supposed to do with this thing, thing, thing I have for you. This thing I have for you. You could talk about it like it's a bug or a fever that burns every day. You could talk about it like it's a drug. Nasty habits don't go away Like a fall down a deep dark pit Or a stumble down a dark hallway It wouldn't be so bad to tolerate If you could say the end of it All my friends that tell me it's a thing Is this a thing? Just a thing I have for you What my friends can't seem to do Is tell me what I'm supposed to do With this thing, thing, thing I have for you Sing I have for you I've been drinking too much coffee I've been reading too many books I've been strung up tight I ain't sleeping right I've been getting some funny looks Seems you're everywhere in town Except the place you're supposed to be Seems you're always running around Except you ain't running into me All my friends that tell me it's a thing it's just a thing, just a thing I have for you. What my friends can't seem to do is tell me what I'm supposed to do with this thing, thing, thing. Oh, this thing, thing, thing. Yeah, this thing, thing, thing I have for you. Oh, oh. Thank you so much, everybody. For I appreciate it. Thanks.